Reminder, last time we were, we started talking about the olfactory system. And uh, you learned about, or we, we discussed a little bit uh, other space and started talking about the olfactory receptors and how uh, some simple rules that we can, we learn from uh, genetics and anatomy. Specifically that uh, one receptor, one OR,
your argument. You, you, you know, these actually exist, right? Like no, no, these three types of neurons. These are specific neurons, okay, that put here in the middle of the uh, ganglion. I think it's du it's duplicate. I think each each uh, animal will have two A W A and two A W B and two A W C, right? So not duplicate. So normally it uh, it also it is lateralized. These are three, only three neurons. The beauty of these systems is that it's identified neurons. So you can go to each worm and it will have, you know, one AWA neuron on this side and you can uh, label it with the GFP and knock it down and knock it off and put any gene you want. It's only the neuron because the dendrite is effectively the receptacle? It's a neuron because it's, uh, you know, it has a dendrite, it has an axon, sensory apparatus of this uh, So one would expect, okay, so now you activate AWA, you get attraction. You activate AWB, you get the worm to uh, avoid the stimulus. So what do you expect will happen if you excite AWC? Very similar to the AWA, right? If you excite it, you activate it, you get uh, attraction. And uh, surprisingly, what they found, oh, one nice, another nice thing about these systems, the C. elegans systems, is that you can use it, of course, the genetics is mind-blowing. You can do, like I said, whatever you want. It's also very fast, okay? To make a knockout worm, much faster than, you know, much faster, much cheaper than to make a knockout mouse, for example. And also, I mean, in recent years, I think also in a long lab here in uh, the university, you can use these things, you can do the genetic manipulations, but you can, you can also do the physiology very in a very clean way, and also the behavior and all of them together. So now they use these uh, microfluidic devices, so they have full control over the worm. So this is the worm crawling in and it can, you know, you can open and close all kinds of valves to put the odor in and odor out and make it turn left or turn right. So the, the simplicity of the behavioral system uh, also makes it a very powerful system to study, again, the whole range from the genes to the full-blown behavior. So in this case, what they do is they do imaging, in this case, calcium imaging of, let's say, of AW. They actually do here for uh, also two neurons downstream, but let's start with AWC. And they, uh, you know, they screen the odorants and they find that uh, AWC has receptors that respond to either or near alcohol. And one would expect to get an excitation. But in fact, what they get, and the yellow uh, bar here shows when they turn the odor on, is that they get actually an inhibition for the AWC. So normally you would expect, in, like in the, you would expect uh, that uh, the AWA would be, uh, give you some kind of excitation to excite the system downstream. But here they actually see a decrease in the activity of the AWC when you excite this neuron with an odor. Okay? This neuron, this AWC, is connected to two other neurons downstream. One is called AIB and one is called AIY. And what they find here is that AIY is excited by an odorant, and the AIB is also inhibited when you apply the odorant. Remarkably, when you take out the odorant, you get a very strong off response in the sensory neuron, in the AWC, and in this case also in the AIB with some delay. So AIY, which is one of the downstream neurons, acts via other application, but these two neurons act via uh, other withdrawal, like an off response. And you know, this is very initially it was very uh, very puzzling, and uh, but uh, later on it was discovered that although AWC uses the same 
north of Twitter, it actually evokes a very different response in the two downstream neurons, and the responses are determined by the receptors, the postsynaptic receptors on these cells. Okay, we will not go into the details, I just want to tell you that this in some way mimics the on and off parallel pathways in the retina and shows you that even in the C elegans you can reveal or unravel very basic mechanisms that you find later on in other central systems. In this case, like in the uh, visual system, like uh, something that looks like an on-off uh, sensory pathway. Okay? Okay, we will not talk a lot about C. elegans because it's a recent work on the C. elegans cell factors that can go down into neural circuit uh, mechanism. That's a little bit, I think, uh, higher order than what motifs and how neural ne networks work, but like I said, when you go high order and you use this kind of animal, which is uh, doing very basic things, it's, uh, it's a different topic than what I want to tell you uh, on the olfactory system in the context we discussed it here. Actually, the C. elegans neurons do not spike. So they are, uh, actually the, a few years ago there was some uh, bite in the that they do spike. Uh, a few labs, one in Stanford, one in Oregon, very uh, prominent uh, receptologists uh, were able to patch these cells because it's very difficult to patch the C. elegans cell neurons. Okay? Generally, the invertebrates and the soft cells are very nice cells in the rotula. When you put them in the dish, they're very, very tiny animals, so the digestion is hard, and, in order, and they have a sheet that covers them very tough sheet. So in order to penetrate, you have to de-sheet the ganglia. So you have to make the fat and open this very, very thin uh, uh, tissue around them. The problem was is that when you open the sheet and uh, expose the neurons, they uh, pop up like uh, popcorn, very difficult to uh, patch. And in the last, I don't know, these people, these prominent neurophysiologists could make, uh, develop methods to uh, actually have a good preparation where they can uh, patch this. Actually, this was a revolution in the rotula. They thought they could do this. And, uh, but still, it's very difficult. I don't know how many people have actually patched neurons on uh, CLA. Probably very few. Very few, if any. Right? I think the, the latest uh, word on it is they don't. They have some kind of potential membrane poten uh, pen potential that maybe an NGS spike. Clearly not the classic of the neuron in any way. But in imaging, it's very good because they can put in uh, these genetically encoded calcium indicators and uh, it's very useful. Anyway, we know much more uh, about the sensory systems of Drosophila and uh, starting to uh, learn about mice. Again, in the flavor of things, I want to tell you uh, in this talk, but I want to learn on this talk. Last Last time we actually ended up with uh, this uh, adult rated R movie on uh, Drosophila to, to show you that these can do uh, more sophisticated uh, behaviors. Still, we don't understand these behaviors as well. Clearly, when you go to mice, there's lots of social interaction. Sniffing is very, very basic. Yeah. Uh, just to ask you, uh, Kandel got a Nobel Prize on his uh, work in, uh, in uh, slugs and memory, on basic uh, concepts in memory. No, absolutely, they can do things. But generally speaking, the beauty of the system is that it's uh, you know, the very basic on-off type of responses, like I showed you before. You know? But how do you use this in neurons? How do you learn this? Well, I don't know if I can answer this question exactly, but you have first many other many, many other anticeptors on these cells, and they are connected to a circuitry downstream, and this circuitry is doing something. So that's what I said when I go when you when you look at the, the new paper of uh, I'm not again I'm not uh, fully updated on, in the field, but it's I hear sometimes uh, Corey Bachman, which is a prominent leader in, the, in this 
Brazil, and she is a, her work is very beautifully talking about you know, basic concepts on you know, circuit designs and things like that, which is what they're trying to convey. You know, because you can't really do super sophisticated things. So maybe it can learn this and that, and maybe if so, we can learn something about learning and memory. Uh, but still, the, the beauty and the caveat of these systems Caveat if you want to say something about high order things, but uh, the power and beauty is in the simple. So somewhere in the middle is Drosophila. Okay, because here Drosophila has far few, fewer neurons. It's genetically an extremely powerful model. Perhaps not as uh, C. elegant, but uh, much more than the mouse. I think, I don't know if we, we have any Drosophila neuroscientists here. Maybe Aaron is a representative <laughs> of, the, uh, of the invertebrate can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can put 13 transmillions or something like that in the other. I don't know about C. You don't know that. What? Too high order. Drosophila is too high order. So I think in Drosophila you can put like 13 transmillions or something like that. I think, you know, roughly on that number. And that will take you a few months or Days to make a fly with 13 components inside the, the genetics of the, of the fly. In mouse, you know, you can knock out, now there are these systems for three lots, so you can put you know, two things in, putting four things in, and taking, you know, four different mice and starting to do the crossing, so you will have a mouse with four different transmitters in, is a lot of now in my lab we have mice with, with the three uh, combinations in, and I'm pay paying a very high price on it. And the students pay a high time in maintaining the, the colonies and the mice because the turnover is still like three weeks until you have babies, and then another two, two months until they grow, and then you have to cross and cross and cross and cross, and it becomes like a big fight. Okay, anyway, to look at this system, this you already know, we started by this. Maybe yeah. Started by the mouse system, and you heard there are, you know, 1,000 other genes here, uh, 1,200. We talked about other species. Drosophila has uh, 60 uh, olfactory receptor neurons, and in this case, it, it has a very similar rule to the human rule we talked about last time. So, in this case, also 60 ORs, and you can find uh, 60 different types of olfactory receptor neurons. 60 different glomeruli in the first station, which is the antenna lobe and which is uh, equi equivalent to the olfactory lobe. Okay? And, and if you look at the, again, these uh, models have been dominated for years and years by people who are doing uh, genetics and behavior, but not so much by electrophysiologists because it was, like I told you before, practically impossible to report on these uh, neurons. There was a breakthrough paper in uh, 2005, which I will mention a little bit later, by Rachel Wilson, who was a graduate student in the uh, Hilo Wang's lab, which basically opened the drosophila field to uh, physiology. And suddenly, you know, once this paper came out, suddenly people like, in the computational field, started sinking their teeth into data coming from Drosophila, and it was a beautiful marriage between uh, a very strong field in genetics and behavior to, uh, to the field of classical uh, neuroscience theory or neurophysiology. Okay? And, but still, the, the field is dominated by scientists who are geneticists that do their science like theory, in the sense that Everything is clear cut, and this is like this neuron is doing this, it causes this behavior through this protein, and things are very, very clear. So the, the, the field is dominated still by these very, very uh, robust and clear examples. You will see also this in when we go to grammar. The flavor of these people on 
one hand, on the other hand, the, the regular north is the other case. Uh, fighting with the, the real, you know, uh, gray stuff, which is this kind of things we have on the board. The two guys calculate complicated coding. Here, life is simple, like in CL again. So this is another example, just to give you a flavor of the type of experiments we do. And this is starting to emerge these days in mice. But until then, you know, so this is, a, I think, a 2007 paper. This is a place where you take all your flies, you throw them into the corridor, and they fly, and then they reach a T uh, choice point, uh, and they can take a right or take a left. And you calculate how many flights will go right and how many will go left, and it's normally 50-50 because nothing, no problem. But it appears flies uh, are sensitive to CO2, they hate CO2, and they will fly away from CO2. So very uh, similar to the CL again method, we say either attractive, attractive for uh, avoiding the CO2, and when you do a globophilic genetics, you can screen for the protein that is responsible for that. And in fact, you can find that this whole behavior is uh, channeled through uh, an odorant receptor called GR21. And GR21 is the odorant receptor respons responsive to CO2. And you can show this in, uh, in, in hex cells, in the Petri dish. And then you go on and you make uh, flies that have, uh, in this case, you, you, are you familiar with the GAL UAS4 system in flies? Are you familiar with the Kuhl Lock system in mice? Yes. So this is very similar. There is a driver and a reporter. The driver here is uh, GAL, it's called GAL4, which is like three. And the reporter is called UAS, which is like the flock for the sake of the argument here. It has some differences, but it doesn't really matter here. But if you take only the driver fly, only the reporter fly, it will not show any avoidance. If you take this, uh, the combined uh, fly, what they put here is they put channel reduction in the GR21 Petri neuron. Okay, in the fly, sorry. If you take only the driver, only the reporter, the three nodes reference, uh, when you shine light on it, when you activate optogenetically these uh, uh, neurons, the driver, only the reporter won't have channel reduction in the reporter. Uh, if you now take this uh, transgenic fly that has channel reduction in GR1, GR21 expression cells, and uh, you give it CO2, you see it's intact. And if you shine light on it, you see that it will uh, now avoid the system as is. Okay? So this is like a final proof. Avoidance through C smelling CO2 is channeled through the GR21 uh, odorant receptor that is expressed in the olfactory receptors expressed in GR21. Okay, so they we try, we want to do these kinds of experiments in mice. I'll show you roughly what we are doing, but that you know, optogenetics basically gives us the ability to do these causal type. Mm, at the molecular level, the ligand, the odorant receptor interaction, yeah. I don't think so. There is actually good literature on the cell biology of the olfactory neurons themselves. You know, all kinds of intracellular cascades, what molecules go up and down once an odor is uh, activating an odorant receptor. But physically, on the, this interaction, aware of you know classical textbook style uh, data but maybe there is some that's why i think it's interesting because if, if you know how the other would interact with the receptors then you might have a basis to to understand how the other uh, receptors work in general if you know the, what what is the criteria for a more these two molecules binding to each other yeah um yeah i guess that in general in biophysics there is a lot of data about you know, ligand and or receptor interaction. 
I don't think there's reason to believe there is anything unique here uh, in that sense. There's actually, I think, one of the students asked me last time about this vibrational theory. Anyway, there's some physicists who came up with a theory that uh, it doesn't have to do with the, the, the genes and receptors, that it's meant for the good stores for biologists, but there is some uh, physical interaction with vibration. Sometimes it's uh, high-end physics that I don't completely understand, uh, that this de determines the activity of the autonomous neurons. So this is exactly what you're asking. Highly, highly debatable. And uh, actually, there was just a recent paper Cited at least that why can can the why the vibration theory is not possible. So, but again, it's hard for me to uh, say anything intelligent about that because I don't. Yeah, it's not my bread butter. It's not my field. So anyway, but there are arguments out there that claim that it's uh, there are all kinds of atomic interactions between ligands and receptors that determine how and are important for how we think. I'm telling you what I should feed you with the classical biology of uh, what to do. Okay, so this is Drosophila, and you know things uh, are simple. This receptor is doing this, and will cause this behavior, etc. In an effort to map other space and receptors, this is a shell paper from 2000. John Carlson from Yale University decided to do a screen, full-blown screen of odorants and the receptors in Drosophila. In Drosophila, it's easy because you can do this in vivo. You can take the fly, cut the head of the fly, no ethic approvals, nothing for Drosophila, stick it on the wax. The odorant receptors of Drosophila are on its antenna, and you can stick a, a microelectrode into one of these cells and record the spiking activity. Okay? It's still alive, yes, of course. The head is still alive with the antenna, and it will be alive for maybe half a day or so. <laughs> and you can stick, what? <laughs> then? No, no, you take the head, you, you disconnect it from the body. And it's still alive. It's still alive, yeah. The, the fly, oh yeah. You can take a fly, cut the head, and the cells will be still alive for a few hours. You can take a cockroach and do the other way around. You can cut his head and you will still walk around for a few hours. Not fully coordinated and everything, yeah? You can't really trust it. But nevertheless, the cells will be, you know, sensory responsiveness for it. Basically, the, the way they do it is... Uh, in, in vertebrates, there is no... Because they think they don't feel pain, there's no evidence for a pain system. No, 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 I'm just going to show you the, I hope I have it here. Yeah, they sense, but there's no pain. Well, I don't have it here, sorry. There is no evidence for pain, right? No evidence for pain. No, there is no evidence in humans also. Ah, in humans? Yeah. Anyway, one can do a full-blown screen by taking these uh, uh, flies and recording from different neurons from the antenna. And the first one who did this was a John Carlson from y John Carlson from Yale and his student Editha. And there, here they screened uh, 24 odorants. And again, the beauty of the system in Drosophila is that you can every time you go to the neuron that sits you know, number four on the antenna, it's always neuron number uh, 37 that expresses other number 37 out of the repertoire of 60. So here they screened 24 different receptors and they screened 100 odorants out of infinite number of odorants, of course. They classified them by, uh, you know, the different uh, chemical groups like we talked last time, shown here in different colors. And basically the result of this paper was this huge matrix. And as you can see, like we talked about in uh, Linda Bach's paper, uh, the combinatorial code, some 
receptors would respond, they have some kind of receptive fit if you want, okay? So for some odorants they would respond uh, with uh, one uh, flush, so it's a weak response. In spiking activities, some very strong response, uh, some very weak response, etc. Some neurons would not respond to any of these odorants. In this case, some would respond with very uh, narrow receptive fit, so it's with very few odorants, etc. Et so basically, the dogma that came out from these types of experiments is something like this. So you should imagine other space, and there is one axis of olfactory space and another axis of olfactory space, to, just for the sake of argument. And some neurons will have a wide receptive field that they will respond to many, many odorants in the world. Some will be uh, specialist odorants, so to speak. Okay, so they have a very narrow receptive field, and the idea is that in olfactory space there will be region which is uh, with a high overlap of many, many different neurons. A uh, little bit like the fovea, if you will, of the retina, for example. But maybe, as we saw from the genetics last time, different animals will have different regions of interest in olfactory space. Because they have different receptors, and maybe, you know, through evolution, and I'm sure yes, they also uh, respond differently. So, hot spot of, olfactory, of the olfactory world for a worm, for a fly, for a mouse, not for us, it can be very different. But generally speaking, uh, this is the main notion which came up out from the, this first uh, screen. In 2011, Linda Buck did a very similar screen to what you saw in Drosophila, but in culture for a mouse neuron. So basically she takes ne a neuron from the epithelium of mice, places them on, uh, on a plate exactly like you saw before in her 1999 cell paper, but now did this for 3,000 single olfactory receptor neurons and for 124 odorants. And she basically, this is a general science paper from 2011, but basically uh, finds the same thing that I'm talking about, okay? Which is this, this, these types of of, uh, of maps. Now, in the case of uh, mice, we still are not the orphan in these receptors. So we don't really know. When she takes out one of these, you know, 3,000 olfactory receptor neurons and puts them in the petri dish, she doesn't know which olfactory receptor it expresses. So when she plays all the 124 odorants to it, she doesn't she can still not de-orphan the receptor like we talked last time. But nevertheless, this paper showed us how is olfactory space represented in the first system in the, in the brain. Okay, so that's the general uh, consensus of the space in the brain. Before we go back to mice, I just want to dwell a little bit on, uh, on Drosophila. First of all is the anatomy. Again, the huge power of Drosophila, of the flies and the Cirrogans, is that it's highly repeatable from animal to animal. So in this case, for example, you can screen flies with their uh, main projection neurons from the olfactory bulb, which is the microcell. I don't know if we talked about microcells last, last time. A little bit. Okay, we'll talk about them much more. But uh, the, the equivalent of the microcell in the fly is called projection neuron, or PN, in short. And this is the axons of different PNs. Okay, so you can make flies with a single projection neuron that sends a single dendrite to a single glomerulus and label it to GFP. And do anatomy of this sort. This is a nice uh, cell paper from Lichon's Blue Lab uh, showing not only how the single neurons expressing the same receptor, they also send their axons to exactly the same place, and also they have an exactly the same branching pattern. So if I give you the tip of an axon of a specific neuron, you can see, you know, it branches up here. This must be a DM6 neuron. I mean, the, the, the specificity and, the, and how it reiterates exactly from animal to animal is quite remarkable. So they can really, you know, take all the neurons in the fly, map their axons, and 
exactly where they go. And when they do this kind of very specific mapping, and this is axons at the post, one of the postsynaptic sites from the uh, antenna lobe or olfactory by the fly, they say that all the recept the neurons that send their axons and respond to food and sex odorants are clustered in a given uh, region in the postsynaptic site. And all the ones that are responsible for making pheromones are clustered on this side. We still don't know what is on this side, for example. But again, sex is very simple. So Drosophila neuroscientists taught us this. Okay? It's very clear cut, very few neurons. They're expressed in specific receptors. They send their axons to specific sites. And this pathway is responsible for specific behavior. Okay? And you will see this if you look at recent uh, mouse work, you will also start to see this. So we're also we're going to describe, like I told you, you know, the pheromone in the, in the tears of the baby, the teenage mouse, which depresses the sex drive in adult uh, animals. So we can identify, you know, the odorant, the molecule, the odorant receptor, and maybe the uh, sensory pathway that uh, excites it. Can you explain the color diagram again? Which one? On the right, yeah. this is so basically you take you screen for flies, and you know uh, which neuron uh, responds to sex, food, or uh, pheromones. Okay, so let's say I know that DL1, DM6, and DM5 are neurons that respond to uh, sex or food odor. Great, and then you say. Let's do some basic anatomy, and they plot, they make like a, so it shows here on the, on the red and the, the thin, you can mark the silhouette of the postsynaptic uh, region, and they do this uh, 3D anatomy, and they say what is the density of the axons in, within the postsynaptic site, okay? And what they find is that all neurons that respond to sex and food send axons into the, I don't know, probably dorsal and whatever side of the Side and it's shown here by the density of the axonal arteries. They send their axons to a very specific spot. And all the neurons from these uh, axons that, uh, that have uh, respond to mating pheromones send their axons here and they branch. The specific branches of these axons are actually uh, have a high density, a hot spot. Target site, the silhouette here is shown in red. This is all the postsynaptic sites. Okay? So basically, if you. Excuse me, hold on. I'm going to fish in here. Okay. The main thing is that ORNs come from here, olfactory receptor neurons, and they make. I told you, 15, many of them come into glomeruli. Here you have these micro shells, or PNs in Drosophila, and they send an axon to the next site. What you see here is the postsynaptic site, and what they're telling us is that sex and food terminates here, neurons that express the sex and food terminate here, and other neurons, which of course express a different receptor, different glomerulus, etc., will end up terminate here. Okay? If you take, there are very few people who did this, but if you take a neuron in human cortex or mouse cortex and label the neuron, you will see beautiful dendrites, okay, going from, I don't know, a layer 5 neuron, going to layer 1, 2, 3, whatever. Its axon is actually a monster. It, will go to, it can go to many, many targets uh, in the brain. And in many cases, we don't even know what is the, the full target repertoire of these, uh, of these monsters. Again, life is more simple, more manageable, more complete in the system, in the, these uh, more uh, simplistic systems. I personally, and I want to tell you a secret, not only uh, our colleague here is a field again, Representative, I am also. My, my history, I did my PhD on cockroaches. Okay. And the, the 
system that they detect uh, wind. When you run with uh, your sandal, you hook them. They have on their antenna a system of neurons that detect wind, and they can now to run, calculate, and run their work. So I have a. I'm now working on mammoths, but I have a, in my heart, <laughs> probably condensed in the ventrolateral part, the neurons of emotion that uh, miss the fly in the interpreter system because of its simplicity. Because now I'm in the dark and I'm waving my hands like as if I know something. And there you know more. Anyway, the big paper came from Rachel Wilson. This was 2005. Rachel Wilson, I think 27 years old or something at the time, 28 years old. She decides that she is going to be the first one to pass, why can't people pass with electrophysiology a fly neuron? And in her thesis, she develops a preparation for the first time that she records a pattern activity from uh, vesicular neurons, which do pass. And that is a breakthrough paper in science, and she soon, soon after she gets her position in Harvard, and she's a big shot in Harvard today, and, but she is a computational neuroscientist and an electrophysiologist the kind of a person that can do both the calculation and the physiology, like the Eddie Mason. <laughs> Very few magicians like that in this world that are smart enough for the computational and have the skills to do the physiology as well. Rachel is one of them. Very prominent uh, computational scientist. And this is already work from her own laboratory. And uh, I think we will also discuss Again, the beauty of those objects. You can take, this is the scheme of the olfactory system. Olfactory receptor neurons, glomerulant projection neurons, okay? Exactly here, olfactory receptor neurons, each one expressing a single organ receptor. Glomeruli, and these are the projection neurons that, uh, up here that send a single dendrite into a single brain. The beauty in those ocula is that you can cut it and put your electrodes in the input and the output channel. And as basic computational scientists, you know that this is perhaps one of the first things we want to know about the system, the input-output function. And here, for the first time, Rachel is able to do that, okay, with her uh, a postdoc at the time, Von der Watt, information neuroscience paper. And then they start to describe an input-output function by recording, putting two electrodes, one in the presynaptic other one in the postsynaptic and starting to look at the responsiveness of these cells. What she finds is that in the same channel, okay, the same input-output channel, when she re uh, responds, when she records from her factory receptor neurons, this is, I don't know, a few re 10 repetitions of the ORN and simultaneously the same 10 repetitions from the postsynaptic cells. Okay? What do we see here? What is the, uh, when you, she puts on the other, I think, at time zero, takes a few uh, hundred milliseconds or so until you start to see an increase in the firing rate of the cell. And you can see, see a few things just by this, okay, just by this input-output function. Okay, let me tell you what we see. Yeah, yeah, so the olfactory receptor neurons are in green. The post those are the ones fitted on the antenna and in our nose for the sake of the argument. Projection neurons are like the micro cells, okay? They are in the olfactory mode or in the antenna, antenna mode, the first station. And in those ocular, you can put your electrode one here and one here. And you can do many other great things, which she has been doing in the last uh, 10 years since one of them we will discuss, but now she's recording from the input and output of this device. And now want to, she wants to see what, what, what happened, what are the computations that go on so early in the olfactory system. So do you see attenuation? So do we see attenuation? What we see is that this, now there are of course 10 of these, or 30 olfactory receptor neurons that converge onto three projection neurons. 
So we see, let's just describe the ba very basic uh, responses. The first thing you see is that there is a much lower dynamic range of the olfactory receptor now, okay? The single cell. A much wider dynamic range in the projection now. The other thing is that these, the PN encodes very efficiently because of this 10 to 1 convergence, the onset of the endostimulus, so they start to fire very, very rapidly. They reach high firing rate, and the peak of the firing rate is uh, when the slope here is still, uh, still rising, okay? Which means that the PNs are more sensitive. You see higher sensitivity, very high, very rapidly, and we need 10 of these, I don't know if we need 10 of these, we have 10 of these that synapse onto uh, one of the uh, projection nodes. We then calculate the input-output function of these cells, which is something of this sort. First of all, like I said, most of the olfactory receptor neurons have a lower dynamic range. They respond by Q spike, so an input to a Q spike. The, micro, the projection neurons, which are equivalent to the microscope, spread out all over the place. So you see firing rates which are very high, more common. <coughs> and this is for the different couples. Just I showed you before one of the couples, okay, one pair of input and output expressing this green receptor, the highlight here, number 24. And this is data for two, four, six, seven of these combinations, okay? So DL1, DM1, DM2, DM4, VA2, VM0, whatever, seven out of the 60 luminals. And what you can see in all of them is that there is a nonlinear relationship that saturates at a given intensity of spikes of the olfactory receptor neurons on the x-axis. There's no more differences in the Again, this is a very, very basic definition of the input-output function of what the olfactory system does at the, uh, in other own cells. So we see a nonlinear transformation. Weak inputs are selectively amplified, while the strong inputs of the ORN are uh, suppressed, or are not suppressed, but uh, they produce a saturated response in the projection neuron. Okay, just one more slide before we go to we go back to mice. And if, like I said, uh, Rachel is a computational neuroscientist, like all of us, or you, and <laughs> I'm a fake one, trying to be one, but uh, collaborating in order to stay alive. Uh, if you look, if you do, if you run a PCA on the olfactory receptor neuron responses of a population, because each of them doesn't respond only to one of them. It has this receptor field that John Carlson showed you before. See when you did the screen here. So each of these, we know the receptor field, so to speak, which is behind the other end. So each of them, you can describe you know, how much information to a given other end to do a population analysis. And if you run a PCA, you can see that there is little information about the different other ends if you look at the olfactory sensory neuron. And there is much more information already which is segregated if you look at the projection neurons. So already, at the level of projection neurons, we're starting to deconstruct other space, if you will, to different, uh, different segments. Okay? So if you look at the PCA, more uh, responses are clustered close by in the olfactory receptor neuron population level. And when you look at the next station up, it's already distributed other space, in PCA space, uh, more pronounced, in a more pronounced way. So we're starting to gain information by this initial transformation. Okay, so let's take a break when we go back to mice and discuss what we know in, uh, what we know in mice.
Okay, so we go back to Mainz. We stopped a little bit in uh, Tel again, a little bit in Brozovila. Go back to Mainz. We'll go back maybe I think a little bit later to Brozovila a little bit and end up with, uh, with mammals as well. This is a beautiful image from uh, Leo Belluccio's work, a friend of mine, uh, Peter Mombach, one of our actual descendants. That's the one that found the singular Y in single uh, receptors, made this these first mice <coughs> with axons going into the glomerulus and microcells. Here Leo labeled the microcells in red. Just a simple injection. And you can see uh, one of the other rules in the olfactory system that the postsynaptic neuron, this microcell, sends a single dendrite into a single glomerulus. Now these cells also have lateral dendrites. <coughs> Actually the back propagating action potential was found in these neurons by Sussman and colleagues. Okay, so those are monster neurons, they're very big, very easy to report from in slices. And they have a huge dendrite going uh, into a single glomerulus and also lateral dendrite. And uh, so the idea is that they get input from a single functional source, so to speak. But because these receptors are broadly tuned, they also get, you know, if you report from a microcell, you will also get this broad tuning. Although from Rachel Wilson just now, we saw that when she put her images here, let's say if you now if you now if you will be able to follow, there's one paper like that, if you follow the dendrite, the postsynaptic cell that sends this. Here you can theoretically image or do something like that. We 
record input and output and do something similar to what people in Lesotho have been doing. I'm not so much there, I'll show you where we are. Okay, so let's step back and see what do we know from uh, Maya. And the first method that tells us something about uh, olfactory, olfactory sensory neuronal representation is a method called intrinsic signal emission. Did you talk about this in the method course at all? No? Okay. So intrinsic, intrinsic signal is uh, a method where you just put a camera, a sensitive camera, over the brain, you aim at the, look at the brain, and you look at reflection from, uh, let's say, normally people use red light over the brain, and it appears that there is magically some signals, and we don't know what they are, and therefore we call them intrinsic signals, intrinsic to the brain, which are probably metabolic, arise from blood flow, and all kinds of light scattering processes that are very nicely correlated with the signals that come from action potential. Is it through a window? Like yeah, so you open a skull. Actually, it's so robust in general that you can even do it by thinning the bone. Mm -hmm. So these images, what you see here, are the olfactory bone. This is olfactory bulb, this is olfactory epithelium, and these are the receptor neurons that turn their action into glomerula. What people do, or what we did here, is we uh, thin the bone until it's optically transparent. So you just go with a driller like the dentist, then you uh, scrape off a little bit of bone. And then it, bec it becomes transparent. Basically, this is what you see here. So this is a transparent bone, but there's still bone on here. And you can see the blood vessels on the brain with this camera. And actually, you shine red, red light on it, and you measure the reflection, the reflectance of light from the brain. And if you give a stimulus, in some cases, depending on the geometry, you can see a signal of that comes from the brain. This method was actually invented by Amiram Dinger, which is now in Weizmann uh, in his earlier days. In Rockefeller University and was there and uh, is, uh, was used and still is used very robustly in sensory systems in uh, the visual system to describe ocular dominance problems so you give you shine light on the visual system and you can easily you can beautifully see the ocular dominance problems and other geometries uh, in, the, in the brain it has a fairly good spatial sensitivity of course, not of single cells, but much more than fMRI, for example, so something like 50 micron resolution. Bad resolution in time because of these signals. So it's somewhere in the middle between single neurons and uh, fMRI. The signals are actually the same as fMRI, which we think from its metabolic perspective, blood flow and things like that. Not exactly the same, but similar to that. But anyway. What? Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is not. A, this particularly is not a wave, but you can look at it in a wave. Change the thin, thinning of the bone is not. Uh, no, you do this in an exercise, but then you wait a Yeah, yeah. After you wait. Okay, so in this case, no. In this case, it's an anesthetizer, and I know that. You don't see much differences in a wave versus an anesthetizer in the olfactory receptor neuron, but uh, you do see. In this case, it's, uh, it's an exercise only. Basically, when you do that, this is the type of data that you get. Okay, so this is the uh, one olfactory bulb, this is the other olfactory bulb. You see these glomeruli light up. Okay, and that was the first indication that this combinatorial code is also used, probably at the level of olfactory uh, of the olfactory bulb, which is the second station in the brain. Therefore, the idea, if you look in the textbook, this is what you see. The, uh, if you give one odorant, you, may, you, you get the excitation of some combination of glomeruli uh, on the second station. And there is overlap. There is mix and match. Okay, So some, some glomeruli, like this one, would respond uh, to both odorants. In this case, the, the propionic 
get in propanol, but some not, so it's a combination of these things. Okay. So this was actually a very prominent uh, method in the early 2000s that was used to study and map the factory profile. Actually, I did my postdoc in the lab responsible, in the, in the lab of Larry Katz, the late Larry Katz, I would say, and some of this is really classical data. Okay, so he initiated that. Anyway, <coughs> a few things that you can learn about those factory profiles. First of all, there is very nice uh, symmetry in the brain. So if you look at one nerve and you excite the nose with proper nerve, this is the type of data that you get to see if there is a single or two glomeruli here on the dorsal surface. And another one, another two on the other, other olfactory part. So very nice symmetry. So when you smell something, both olfactory bulbs light up. Nicely symmetrical. You take another odor, this is the same now, different glomeruli will be activated, but still roughly similar. Symmetry is not bad. See here these three or four glomeruli light up, and maybe something here, and here also, two glomeruli light up. Quite remarkably, if you take different animals and you excite them with the same odorant, you see that they activate roughly the same region in the olfactory bulb. Okay? So there is quite a robust activation, which is roughly similar. You see it in this region of olfactory bulb. Here it's a little bit more anterior in this case. But nevertheless, thick. Okay? And the person who mapped this thoroughly is Marcus Meister. When he was still in Harvard, he moved uh, two years ago to Caltech. This is the guy who wrote the nasty rebuttal to the hum human can smell one trillion odors. And he wrote a mathematical paper saying you are completely wrong. Not nasty, of course. Just bold. Aggressive, if you will. Anyway, so uh, this is Marcus Meister, again, a very prominent computational neuroscientist that can do both experiments and calculations. And what he did here is he used intrinsic signal imaging to map uh, odorants on both olfactory bulbs, and what he found, again quite remarkably, is that each glomer he can find a glomeruli on the olfactory bulb, which have like a fingerprint, like a barcode of activation of which odorants they are activated by. Very similar to what Carlson did before in, in the fly, remember this, this uh, the, oh, the whole map of, uh, so each one has a given, in this case it was uh, in the context of the cetacean slide. What Marcus Meister claims in this paper <coughs> is that if you take a hundred odorants and you look at a single at a agglomerulus on the dorsal surface, you can find glomeruli with specific fingerprints. In this case, the glomerulus that responds to order number 1, uh, 7, 26, and 27, 100, and whatever, I don't know, okay? It has a specific barcode, and I can identify it if you screen for 100 dollars. And you can find the same glomerulus on the other side of the olfactory. So this is one glomerulus that you find on the left side. This is the other one on the right side, just flip so you can see the, how similar they are. <coughs> Basically, he says that each one has a specific fingerprint for some combinations of others. Moreover, if he then calculates, okay, let's identify these glomeruli on the left and right side of the olfactory bulb. Okay, I can identify this one here. Like I told you before, very symmetric. But now I can do this for all the glomeruli on the dorsal surface. It's not all of, it's not all of the glomeruli like in the ocula, but you can definitely identify them. 70 or 100 glomeruli <coughs> over here. And what he, he then calculates, <coughs> he, he aligns the left and the right sides of the brain onto one another, okay? So he just flips them on top of one another. And he's uh, aligning them based on one very prominent glomerulus. And he then says, what? Let's say he, he aligns them to the gray glomerulus right side, okay? Or let's say the blue one. 
Then he says, okay, now let's look where is the black glomerulus. He finds it right here. You then look where is the green glomerulus. Here it's here, here it's a little bit off. And you calculate the vector of how far are two glomeruli from each other on the left and right side of the graph. Most of them have a very, you know, it, it has a direction, this vector, and an amplitude of how far this glomerulus is. And he finds, and this is a map of all the glomeruli. Okay, so there are a few glomeruli which are quite off in distance, but most of them, the size, the average size of a vector is two glomeruli. So if you look at the left and right side of the brain, the development of the brain is such that it's so precise to a noise of about two glomeruli on the left and right hand side of the brain. So it's highly symmetric and very precise. During the development of the animal? During the, both the development and the life, because the physiological changes to the nose might. Yeah, so there are a few papers like that. Uh, first of all, during development, I didn't tell you that, but there are actually multiple glomeruli. And then they coalesce to one glomerulus when the animal grows up a little bit. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that people did things like. Printing, so you go to the pup, to the baby pup, and you, I don't know, you, um, on the mother's stomach, you put an odor, let's say odor number three here, or not odor number three, one of the odorants here, which should activate several glomeruli, but usually more robust with one of them, and you can look at the glomerulus. Normally, they don't change in uh, position, but there's more axons here, so the, the glomeruli will be larger. Not many papers on this. Okay, so we know it's symmetric, and we know again that it's combinatorial code. The other uh, work was whether we have a spatial structure, clear spatial structure, which is functional in the olfactory system. So in the retina, we have retinal structure. In the auditory system, we did not learn, but you will, we have phonotopic. Do we have chemotopic? in the olfactory system. And the first observations was, yeah, that, yes, there are. So what they do, you take a carbon molecule, propanol, for example, an aldehyde with three carbon atoms, and you do intrinsic signal imaging, and you see these two glomeruli light up. And then you take C3, and you take C4, sorry, it's a butan, it's an, another aldehyde, exactly the same molecule, but one, mole one carbon atom larger, and you image and you see that it activates a region next door. And you take C3 and 4 and you see that it is cumulative and you start to map whether olfactory space has a chemical structure on the brain. And the initial observations with raw manipulations was, were that they were, there is actually gross somatocon uh, on the dorsal surface of the brain. In this case, they wanted to ask whether the, if you uh, mix two odorants, where you get the sum of the two odorants in the olfactory uh, system, or whether there are some cross interactions between the, uh, the different odorants. And in fact, based on these papers, the uh, dogma is, and still is, is that if you mix two different odorants, you get the sum of the two maps. So you map to C3, you map the C4, and when you look at the map of C3 plus C4, you can evaluate it by the linear sum of both maps. This is not true when you look at the projection neurons, the microreceptors, the next station. Okay? But if you look at olfactory sensor neurons, it's a linear summation of the two different linears. And perhaps the most robust experiment that shows this, this was with two different others, is this uh, experiment right here, a neuron paper from 2006. Da Yulin, the best lab. She was in our laboratory, a Chinese girl, extremely smart and uh, energetic, like the wind. She would drive us all crazy. She came to the lab in two years. She had two nature papers and a neuron paper, and we're all struggling there with our uh, work to get a good paper out. Anyway, she was brilliant. 
Phil is brilliant. He now has a, a lab at uh, NYU in New York, doing beautiful work. Anyway, so that you, when she was uh, young, uh, in the lab and during her PhD studies, took this uh, question. And what she did is she took she took coffee. I told you coffee is a lie. Is Although Nestle or whatever did not tell her what is in the coffee, she found that it activates very promptly the dorsal process of the olfactory lobe of mouth. So basically when she gives coffee, this is the map that she gives. She gets many glomeruli activated with different things. What she then did is she took a graph gas chromatographer machine. This is the machine that allows you to break the odor to its components. I, when I started talking about this, I told you the difference between vision and olfaction and audition, that in audition, the beauty is that you can put a microphone and then you know exactly what sort of skin it is. Here it's very hard. The, the, the machine you use is called gas chromatography. It's the thing that when you go to the airport, they, they rub on you with a small uh, thing on your suitcase, whatever, to see if there is a component of a bomb. Anyway, you take coffee. You put coffee through the gas chromatographer machine, and what coffee does is, it, what GC does is it breaks the odor to its different components. So what you see here is a timeline, this is the T axis, the time axis, and uh, GC heats up through different coils the odor, the bouquet of the odor, and it will uh, put out the port a different, uh, different peaks at different times. And what you see here is the, you can image the brain during this time, and this is the glomerulus you see at this peak. And then later on, a few seconds later, this peaks come on. And later on, this peaks come on. And later on, this peaks come on, etc., etc. And what she then did is she took all these small, these glomeruli from the peaks that she collected individually of the individual components and compared it to the uh, to the full-blown coffee when it was given at once, and she sees a one-to-one -one registration. Meaning that at least at this stage of processing of the olfactory sentinel, there is a linear summation of the inputs. Okay? So other representation by ORM is cumulative at the level of axons in the olfactory bulb. I, I must say that this signal is mostly uh, olfactory receptor neurons driven. Because there are so many axons, 15,000 axons converging into a glomerulus, it's dominated by this, uh, by this huge, uh, huge signal. Yeah. Excuse me. Is the difference where it started? Is that just on the left side or the right side? Or where is the Okay, so uh, a stereotypy in the sense of uh, a lateralization in uh, the olfactory system. We don't know much about that. There was actually, uh, so the short answer to the question is yes. We will get maybe to one of the slides later. First paper was actually in 2005 in Science entitled Rat Smell in Stereo. This paper was, uh, there was some crit criticism about it, but the scientists uh, actually had did a very nice job recently. And Rachel Wilson, the one in Garbosula, did an amazing paper that came out last year on, uh, about this, how, what is the mechanism of going left to right in uh, the fly. And the way they do it is they play odors from different uh, regions in space and you get, do, get, do get different uh, responses. Yeah. Yeah, so it's different uh, molecules. So, so this is a molecular weight uh, graph? Not only, it's, uh, so basically you take the whole bouquet and you uh, pass it through a coil with specific uh, parameters and you heat it up a lot. And then different molecules behave very differently when you heat them up and have them pass through different, uh, different uh, substrates. So do a few of these manipulations, each molecule separates very differently. It's like running molecules on a jet or two-dimensional jets. They have very different properties. 
active, and then they will uh, evaporate at the big bang. Not all of them, I mean, 99% of the molecules will evaporate at the big bang. So that's the way it works. So this is how you actually separate the oil through in order to use the molecule. Yes, to do it really very good, you have to use two different coils, and then this peak will come out at time, I don't know, after 10 minutes in this coil, but in a different coil it will come out early or late. If you do two coils, you get 100% separation all the time. But that's, that was just a... This is actually how they... Did I tell you about the rabbit? No? Did I tell you about the rabbit? Do you like stories? Or <laughs> when I saw it, it was useful. This is when I get popular... Uh, okay. What the heck, right? I sure can be... Uh, can misbehave. Uh, I gave you some cinema secrets. <coughs> Anyways, it's a nice story. It's a nice biological story. story there's a uh, I also work on motherhood on mothers and uh, rabbits are very bad mothers rabbits actually spend like five minutes a day with their pups all the rest of the time they're outside shopping in the mall eating grass <laughs> chatting with friends so it's like 0 0.0 I don't know three percent of her time is taking care of the chicks, the rabbits. Well known for being bad mothers. <laughs> but the baby pup, when she comes back to the nest, they have five minutes a day to find the nipple of their mother, otherwise they will get mange. So their olfactory system is extremely uh, sensitive to specific odors on the nipple of their mother. So there's a beautiful paper in uh, Nature Paper taking the smell from the nipples of the mother and holding baby rabbits like this, very cute, in front of the, as a GC cross. Okay, they hold the baby rabbits like that. They're very cute. And they run the odors on the, the baby rabbits that have the color streak, that are more on the finger, and they run the odors, one kilo per minute. And when a specific peak comes in, the baby rabbit wakes <laughs> up and <laughs> jumps on the pores of the GC to start sucking the and this way they found a specific pheromone from the mother's uh, milk that uh, activates this uh, this odor. They found this uh, pheromone in humans too. I, I said something about this. I said talk about the, this human pheromone. Well, it was found in rabbits. I don't know if it's the same one. Jerome and Shaul will talk about pheromones, so I won't uh, ruin his talk. Uh, anyway, but that's a GC. So it, it actually people use this a lot to find in insect biology to find pheromones. So uh, you c because insects are very uh, stereotype behaviors, you run a pheromone, uh, the smell of I don't know, a moth, female moth, and you know, or a cricket. Crickets are too big and nothing forever. And you play these peaks, and then at this peak, he will start uh, beating his wings to call for the females, and there they find this list of pheromones. In, in much parts of the world, not in animals, not probably too. Okay, so 
So is there a special organization in Gorkakri law? This is uh, not from, this is Ynet, but uh, it's actually a very nice nature paper by a Japanese group showing you, again, just to get you, give you a flavor of what geneticists can do, which is similar to sea elegans and uh, rosettes. So basically they found a, a molecule that is expressing in a group of olfactory receptors on the dorsal surface of the olfactory bone, and they basically knocked it out. What they claim is that they created mice, fearless mice, that are not afraid from anything, and therefore it made the news, not only uh, nature, but also uh, all the popular press, and they show these mice hug with, uh, with kittens, papers, what they do is they make a pre-lock mouse, this molecule called Omax is uh, expressing in only in the specific part of the uh, olfactory bulb of an ovular, or the olfactory receptor neuron, and they cross it with a reporter mouse that is expressing a DTA, which is a toxin, basically it's a self-healing machine, all the neurons that will express this molecule will kill itself, will die, and essentially they make a mouse, this is a wild type mouse, all the mice that have this molecule in these two uh, groups of glomeruli will disappear completely uh, from the animal. So they make a, an animal that they call w, uh, Delta B, which has no glomeruli on the dorsal surface of the brain. And they run, so they make this genetic manipulation and they run this avoidance test Exactly like you saw in Sea Elegance. So they put an odor at one end and they test if the mouse is going towards this or away from this with some kind of, uh, calculate some kind of index. In this case, it's investigation time of the odor. Okay, even less sophisticated than the Sea Elegance in this case. So they just put the mouse in the cage, put the odor here and test how much time it will investigate this within and you can see if you put urine into the cage, the mouse will go and sniff it. So urine is attractive. The mouse will find it uh, interesting, at least. If you put peanut butter, let's look only at the white type, which is a, a brown one. Peanut butter, they like. Uh, and all these, there's no difference. Regional, vanilline, vanilla, water, etc. And now there are a group of odorants which stink, and the mouse don't like them, starting from, uh, from acid. And perhaps the most uh, studied one is called TNT. It's a component from uh, fox urine, and it uh, induces a very strong behavioral uh, aversive response in animals. Okay, also leopard urine. This is also a nice story in the lab. My boss decided to work on urine. After a month, the lamp was stinking so bad, it's as if you go into the you know bus station in uh, Tel Aviv. <laughs> terrible. So we were rioting in the lab, all the students and postdocs, but no more. We cannot stand it anymore. And they built a huge system of uh, vapor uh, to clean the lab. Anyway, so this was fun. There's also human urine in these experiments. We have to donate our own. The mice, and there is actually a company where you can buy urine. It's called P something. I don't know. <laughs> they collect it from uh, zoos. Not sure. You can find. Uh, you can buy it on the web in liters, big bottles. Leopard, lion urine, etc. People in the field they use it. Uh, what's the name? What is this? Farmers, yes. leopards or lions flying around. But actually the most interesting components in the urine they are very fresh and they evaporate quite rapidly. And so I used this Chinese student, she, she made a system to collect fresh urine. So it was a, a, like a conus like that, some special metal that the urine would, uh, uh, 
vector that is supermass that would fall into a into a minus 80 degree uh, epilogue so the mass would ski and it would fall and freeze instantly to minus 80 degrees and it was the best <laughs> it could induce the best responses in the brain <laughs> high quality actually urination is very you'll hear it in uh, your own stuff a very potent biological uh, cue in animals humans not so much but anyway so the idea is then when you look at this knockout mouse sorry my computer is still uh, trying to put up the graphics so uh, when you take the uh, delta d mice which don't have these nuclei you see some decrease in the the attraction operands some operands split suddenly they become uh, attracted to uh, some acid but uh, most interestingly in this case is that these uh, these odors that cause aversion to the mouse are no longer there, and sometimes the mouse are even attracted to so these aversions. Why would they be attracted? Mm, not not being a okay. yes. This is 18 seconds. Yes. Yeah, so five seconds. Well, I don't know if it's a minute. Maybe it's 30 seconds or something. I don't know. Maybe it's out of 30 yeah, seconds. It's still aversion. If it's uh, no, no. I think the the level was. Three seconds was the level of uh, statistical uh, zero or something. It's the dashed red line. That's the zero. Anything underneath it, it's uh, avoidance. Underneath, uh, above it, it's uh, attraction. May I don't know. Maybe it's 20 seconds. Or something. I don't remember the exact number, but the structural statistics was, I guess, so. Anyway, the bottom line, it's a very good question. But it's a little bit complicated to answer. And uh, the idea is that some odorants are uh, by default should be attracting or aversive and that you suppress and uh, activate these two uh, suppressors. So one can be, it is, TMT is uh, activating other glomeruli. So it's not only these glomeruli, but the idea is that it's activating other glomeruli which activate the attraction circuitry. So to speak. Okay? But it's a little bit more complicated than that. I don't want to get into it uh, at this level of uh, just to study your time. So it's just like the lowest grade of get, it's like the first level. That would yeah, they no, they smell them through different glomeruli. Yeah, they so activate different different circuitry. What? They cannot uh, smell the scary aspects of cats, but the cats apparently have some attracting even. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. This is the TMT experiment. You know, the Ynet is. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's, it exists. That's the data from the paper. It's not real cats. Actually, I try to do real, not real cats, but real uh, ferrets. You know, ferrets? Have you seen? Yes. They stink a lot. Too many uh, stories here. I should be more serious. <laughs> so, if you look at the recent literature, this is 2011, but it, you, uh, it was just a paper from this same group uh, a few months ago. They also tried to categorize, like I showed you earlier in robotics. So, you remember what Sylvia asked about the, the axons? You know, they, they are dense here, spectrum pool is here. The pheromone they're making is down here, whatever. I don't know. Again, that's what they try to do. These nematocysts, they try to tell us the dorsal glomeruli here activate aversive behaviors to food. So stinky food is here. Uh, here is more conspecific, behaviorally relevant stimuli, like this TMT, urine odor, etc. And on the bottom is uh, attractive behavior, food, learning, things like that. So they like to categorize the brain into specific regions and this would be the state of the art okay, in that context. The other point is about somatopy. There was huge argument in the field. So I told you before that people map, in this case with the Lucian Cass paper, map uh, molecules C3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. And they show that there is gross somatopy on the brain. 
However, if you look at fine chemotopy, what did I say? Sorry, chemotopy. And since I also have chromatopic issues in my brain, it's a bit myopic. Chemotopy. So there is a general chemotopy in the sense that you can find out that it's here, alcohol is here, it's here. Here, but take this with a grain of salt because if we now zoom in to the regions of ketones, there are very different things happening. One example to this is you take molecules that are called enantiomers, which are essentially the same molecule but with just uh, atomic differences in the symmetry of the, of the molecule. You will find that uh, plus and, and they're called plus and minus, plus and minus carbon, plus and minus. First of all, mice can differentiate, I cannot differentiate plus carbon from minus carbon, but mice can do that quite easily. And if you do these maps, these brain maps, to the different uh, molecules, you'll find that suddenly some glomeruli pop up in, di in very different regions which don't uh, add up beautifully in a spatial domain. So you would think that you know, they are occupying exactly the same region, but if you look at fine scale chemotopy, it breaks down the fine scale. So you see ketones that, to be more precise, if you look at aldehydes, yes, most of the activation will be here, but you will find spots of activation all over the place. As you say, fine scale, it, uh, it uh, drops uh, completely. And like I said, or like you mentioned before, if you look at the uh, TMT, for example, the extinct theodos, it will activate these glomeruli in the dorsal surface and won't activate the sphere surface, so to speak, won't region where the sphere surface is. But you can teach the animal that TMT is good for you. So he will learn not to be afraid from the urine or the fox, but actually to be attracted to it. If you just do classical conditioning and couple it through, uh, through rewards. And what these authors suggest is that there are circuits for fear and circuits for rewards. And if you look at the olfactory system, you will find different glomeruli that send their uh, axons downstream from, they have representative from both of these systems. But initially, either innate or there is one which is more dominant and if the animal will smell TMT, those glomeruli will be activated stronger and will activate the sphere circuitry and the animal will be fearful from the fox urine. However, you can still teach it to not be afraid from this and then you, you get this uh, uh, domination of the ventral glomeruli which will activate the learning process. so strong? Yeah, that you cannot reverse it in learning. Uh, I don't know explicit experiments like that. I mean, you need a serious ethics approval to do it on the disgusting side. I mean, it's, you know, so the very aversive odorant, whether you can teach it. I know examples of odorants, many odorants that you can flip, but ones that are so strong that you cannot flip, I don't know. I think also it depends on the concentration. There are many examples of odors that are, uh, with experience, change their odor, also. But initially you smell them and they're not good, and then you like it, you learn to like them. So of flipping I know, of non-flipping non I don't know. Okay, another cool example before we finish today, coming from the house of Richard Axel. The lab of Richard Axel. Richard decided again, very drosophila like for TLC. Let's see if the spatial organization is important in the olfactory system. What he made, he made a mouse that, ex that he forces all the olfactory receptors to express a single olfactory receptor. He called this the monoclonal nose mouse. He made a clone. And he forced by genetic tools, which you will learn in genetics class if you take, not here, 
how to force, which is actually a very interesting story on how a given olfactory receptor decides which of the 1,000 olfactory receptors you have to express, but Axel understands it, Rigolak understands it, and you can trick the system to express. So basically, this is a mouse with one organ receptor expressed. Okay? Now he chose this one because we know what is the ligand of this receptor. I told you most of them are orphans. This one is not. And this one is actually responsive to an odor called the phytophenone. A phytophenone has a smell of almond. We have it in the lab. It's actually not a bad 